Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to present this keynote and for the excellent organization of this great event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, uh, talking about trends in ISR technology, I focus on the uh, industrial perspective. Uh, as already mentioned, uh, Heathgate Resources and UIT in Dresden, Germany belong to the US uh, group of companies under the General Atomics umbrella. Uh, with the uh, two uh, companies, I represent Heathgate Resources, an Australian exploration and mining company on the one side, and uh, then UIT in Dresden, an uh, engineering and consulting company running uh, quite nice facilities suitable in particular to uh, investigate uh, in situ recovery and to provide the uh, development and manufacturing basis for radiological borehole locking tools most suitable for in situ mining development. I'd like to uh, refer to a very early um, uh, uh, book uh, written by Georgius Agricola that was uh, published nearly 500 years ago, the first reference describing uh, the uh, in situ recovery of copper uh, from mine effluents collected in wooden basins and concentrated just by evaporation. Next, uh, talking about in situ recovery, I'd like to refer to a dictum. In situ recovery is like playing chess. Just knowing the rules doesn't mean you understand the game. I'd like to demonstrate this in much more detail, uh, following the context and outline sh shown here. Uh, first, mentioning the overall trend ISR 4.0. I need to explain this. I uh, uh, summarize the ISR feasibility criteria, summarize recent advancements, and uh, emphasize the two important sides of in situ recovery, uh, hydrology, and chemistry that interplay. I briefly review bio-leaching trends, uh, emphasize economics, and uh, finally I review current R&D trends from an industrial perspective. So let's go on. First, uh, the key factors of the future mining in general comprise extreme mining, adaptive mining, the digital mine of course, uh, value mining networks. Without going into details, I switch to the um, mining three uh, objectives, the trends uh, to in place or uh, the less visible uh, mining, uh, including the inline recovery, selective precision mining and underground physical beneficiation, the in mine recovery, um, adding the chemical digestion in the underground and last not least the in situ recovery that has been developed since the late uh, 50s, early 60s. Uh, that's the selective leaching of metals by operating well fields with uh, dedicated lixivians. Uh, most of the uh, in situ recovery applications uh, have been developed to produce uranium since the 60s. Uh, Maxim Zeretkin will uh, review the application uh, to other metals uh, in his uh, presentation later this morning. So I skip this for my uh, presentation and come to the overall uh, trends in in situ recovery. The early years uh, that was the development of this technology in the former Soviet Union and in parallel in the United States with some early applications followed by a first uh, ramp up in the uh, uh, 70s and 80s uh, where when uh, many ISR mines had been developed in the former USSR and in the USA, followed by new ISR mines uh, in Eastern Europe mainly. But then there was a stagnation in the late 90s uh, and leaving quite a few legacies from the uh, early uh, quite uh, crude uh, applications of the in-situ mining. Then we had uh, another mining boom in the uh, 2000s and 2010s uh, based on the development on new uh, recent technology uh, ISR mines in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, United States, Russia and Australia. Uh, considering improved environmental regulations and standards and implementing uh, improved technological approaches for ISR 
mind development, performance, and aftercare. And following the overall trend in the industry, I had found it uh, yeah, reasonable to define an ISR 4.0. That's exactly the application of the overall trends of 4.0 in the industry uh, and making benefit of all the uh, sides of this uh, recent development that is has still to come. And uh, at Heathgate Resources, uh, with the support by UIT, we follow these overall trends. And I don't uh, mention all these terms uh, that are around the globe uh, defining this. Uh, I'd like to demonstrate that we are on the right track to go for ISR 4.0. ISR uh, in the sense of the standard ISR uh, operation means the operation of well fields in saturated ore bodies. You uh, develop uh, the uh, injection and extraction wells uh, at a certain geometry adapted to the ore body, uh, and you run a circle of a lixivian or the leaching solution that is conditioned uh, appropriately and uh, then the well fields are uh, developed consecutively to uh, run a mine. Uh, most important then is the extraction of the metals of interest by a processing plant and you end up with the final product. So easy. That's uh, just uh, a pumping exercise uh, combined with some chemistry. Uh, well, here are some uh, pictures showing the recent well fields in our operations in South Australia. On the one side, that's a real practice. On the other side, uh, just a, a, a schematic or a, a result of a three-dimensional uh, hydrological modeling uh, with well fields embedded in the regional uh, hydrology. Um, Alternative ISR technologies have been developed more conceptually and partially uh, realized in industrial scale, uh, including the uh, mainly percolate ISR in Vedos ore bodies. There are different concepts. Uh, the block leaching in the underground mines that is, has been realized in the industry in the 70s and 80s, and I refer just briefly uh, to the main application I know, that is the Königstein mine in East Germany, where, uh, where about 17 million pounds U308 had been produced by implementing a quite perfectionized uh, scheme of in situ recovery by, by block leaching, of, uh, diff by applying different technologies. I don't like to go into the details. Nevertheless, no significant current operations are known uh, for applying ISR to uh, Vedo's zone or to block leaching. Um, the rules of playing chess, the ISR feasibility uh, criteria, that are the main characteristics of the ore body, uh, including the ore morphology and the uh, 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 grade distribution, hydrology in particular, referring to a structural model and understanding, including the irregularities that uh, are uh, very important for getting ISR mines approved, and also focusing on the uh, uh, free fluid porosity and hydraulic conductivity. I explain later the importance of this. Then the mineralogy in general for the uh, metal uh, in the uh, uh, occurring in the minerals and also referring to interfering uh, minerals. Then the groundwater chemistry uh, criteria and last not least the microbiology that may, might play a role. So all this is uh, developed by field exploration and test work. And then here you see the two important sites of ISR. The well field design on the one side to establish the right uh, uh, hydrological schemes to get the lixivian in contact to the minerals on the one side. And on the other side, the development and uh, uh, application of a suitable leaching chemistry uh, so uh, we emphasize ISR hydrology on the one side with regard to the contact of lixivant and ore, and we emphasize the ISR leach chemistry and kinetics. And in particular, we have to solve what I call the redox puzzle when applying to reduced ores. This is a challenge and uh, uh, will be demonstrated. These two sites of in situ recovery are interacting together and determining the uh, flow 
rate and the pore volume exchange rate on the one side and the leaching kinetics on the other side, both together determining the production rate. Uh, this is uh, simulated by applying reactive transport models in uh, one dimension up to three dimensions. This is meanwhile uh, typical or usual industrial practice. Uh, but in order to assess the um, uh, feasibility of an ISR project, it is most important to apply an economic model and to compare uh, your cost against the uh, uh, current market trends. So I have prepared three overview slides. The first one uh, is uh, the exploration delineation methodology and 3D deposit modeling. So we apply the common uh, exploration technologies to characterize the ore body. Here I'd like to emphasize uh, uh, a few. The first is in order to uh, get the best knowledge about the uh, structural environment of the formation, we uh, go for advanced high resolution seismic uh, from 2D uh, to 3D and most recently we try to make use of non-specular response from the underground and such a test is uh, uh, going on right now. Uh, most important also the hydrological serving in general and in particular applying the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance providing the, pore, the free fluid pore, rosity and uh, the estimated permeability that, but that is uh, very important for well field design. Uh, that's just an outline of the uh, NMR. Uh, then uh, what we have developed at uh, Heathgate uh, and mainly at UIT in Dresden is a brand new uh, advanced from fission neutron locking tool combined with time resolving uh, gamma ray spectroscopy and uh, that provides uh, not only the accurate uh, uranium crate uh, but also the uh, 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 gamma ray intensity based on spectroscopy, uh, deducing a few geophysical parameters that are used for lithological profiling, and uh, last not least, the elemental and mineral locking. So this is a quite complex tool. Uh, that's what we consider the key exploration technologies for ISR applications. And all this data are uh, compiled and assessed in a way to build up the uh, uh, different types of uh, deposit models or formation models starting with the excuse me starting with the uh, hydrogeology in general the regional structural 3d model the regional hydrological 3d model where the well field hydrology will be embedded later on and then uh, important the 3d or deposit uh, mapping including the uh, uh, metal crate and all the uh, determining geophysical, geochemical parameters I had uh, summarized. Uh, then uh, taking cores, we, uh, uh, core samples, we uh, have uh, applied different kinds of conventional core assays. I'd like to mention only the uh, um, mineral liberation anal analysis uh, that is comparable to CAMSCAN. That is quite important. Uh, then uh, recently we applied advanced core techniques, uh, the microcomputer tomography based on x-rays, then the positron emission tomography to um, visualize the fluid flow in decimeter scale and uh, the investigation of uh, uranium speciation based on time resolved laser fluorescent spectroscopy. I like to emphasize also that sample preparation and uh, the careful handling uh, in, in, in the case of reduced ores in, under a uh, nitrogen atmosphere is most important to uh, uh, avoid any interfering uh, effects in advance of tests. The next is the uh, batch test, kinetic leach test. Here we uh, have developed different kinds of new uh, column leach test facilities. I don't like to go in details, but in particular, uh, establishing the temperature and pressure conditions as in the aquifer. And uh, then the most challenging task is to uh, uh, simulate the column tests by reactive transport modeling and then to upscale those to uh, the 3D well field world. 
Uh, this has been solved recently in a very consistent manner, and this is the basis for applying the 3D uh, reactive transport modeling for well field simulation and well field design. The uh, part three is the uh, well field planning and optimization. Here, I'd like to uh, refer to a recent field leach trial at Four Mile West where we have applied the uh, electro-resistivity tomography to visualize the fluid flow in the underground. This is a way to uh, uh, make in situ recovery uh, visible to some extent. Uh, this video uh, shows you how we can dig into the underground. There is a field leach trial, uh, well field pattern, uh, a seven spot one with six injectors uh, surrounding one extractor. There is the uh, ore body outline, and then we start to operate this particular well field pattern, and you can visualize the fluid flow in the underground right from the start up uh, due to the imaging and the uh, uh, electroresistivity due to the highly conductive lixivian flow. That was very uh, uh, conclusive for our hydrologist in particular. And we have seen uh, that the fluid flow is not homogeneous in general. And there are some uh, hydrogenities and uh, well explained by the permeability profile in the underground. Then ISR well field planning, applying a well field model with regard to hydrology. Here we went from conventional uh, stringent well field pattern design to an adapted uh, advanced well field uh, design that has uh, resulted in significant cost sa savings and the setup of the ISR chemistry is also very important with regard to the uh, redox reactions. I will explain this in more de de detail later. Then we have the actual well field operation um, uh, uh, combined with the well field monitoring and control uh, with regard to the hydrological conditions, the lixivian chemistry, and last not least, uh, establishing a monitoring well for environmental compliance. We have, have uh, a talk about recent developments at Beverly uh, in, in the next uh, presentation. Most important, there is a feedback ba uh, based on the monitoring. Uh, our uh, well field hydrologists are have developed an, an approach to uh, improve uh, the uh, well field operation, uh, operation by different measures, including injector extractor role reversals, infill wells, and rescreening to optimize the production. Uh, here on the right uh, side, you see uh, just an example of well field uh, simulation in a retrospective uh, by. Re Prospective modeling and the forecast uh, where the actual well field data are fit into this well field model for a most reliable forecast as we go forward. Next part is the uh, uh, metal processing in the uh, ISR mine operations. Here we clearly follow the uh, trend of the 4.0 uh, uh, industry. Uh, at least we are prepared to go in this way. Uh, then what we do is to uh, establish a uh, high level uh, process simulation uh, with regard to applying uh, uh, engineering software on the one side for plant design, on the other side uh, applying a unique reactive transport software for optimizing the ion exchange columns. This is uh, quite unique. Then the advanced digital control system uh, established recently application of robots. Uh, there is an example for packaging the uh, uranium trumps, uh, quite an advance. Then uh, continuous measurement of uh, uranium metal concentrations in the processing liquids, a brand new method that we are currently implementing overall towards 4.0 uh, trends. Post-mining measures and ISR aquifer restoration uh, to achieve the regulatory approvals, most important. And we apply one and the same chemistry, but in a, 
uh, much wider scale uh, to understand what is the fate of the mining fluid in a uh, much longer term. There are some uh, figures showing this uh, in a 100 year scale and uh, by the reactive transport modeling we simulate this natural attenuation with regard to neutralizing and uh, reducing effects, immobilizing the uranium and uh, neutralizing the lixivant in longer term. We have to be prepared to uh, enhance natural att attenuation if necessary. Active treatment is not uh, considered in our Australian operation, but it's usual practice in the United States. Uh, just a few other sites uh, of the environmental monitoring. That is the uh, uh, groundwater monitoring I uh, have already mentioned, then airborne environmental monitoring. And here is another example of an, a cementing truck for well decommissioning. Uh, so we are prepared to run ISR uh, operations in, in, in general terms, uh, considering all the sites. Next, uh, just to focus what we can learn from uh, some core uh, studies. And here I refer to the importance of heterogeneities in, in situ recovery based on studies of uh, microcomputer tomography to simulate the fluid flow. Um, there is, uh, I'll go back. Yeah. there is one example for a cretaceous uh, silty cell zone, very homogeneous. There the uh, uh, fluid velocity distribution is uh, uh, accordingly very homogeneous. Then we have a cretaceous diomictite with quite heterogeneous conditions. And last not least, a uh, Jurassic sandstone uh, where you can see the micro certification that comp is comparable to the annual rings of a tree. And this points to the effect of anisotropy of the uh, uh, permeability in the underground. The next example is the application of suppositron emission tomography. That means you dope the injecting, uh, injected fluid with uh, radionuclides and you visualize the fluid flow in uh, course in decimeter scale. This is an example here uh, that is shown in this image where we have a quite uniform flow uh, through the core sample. The front sh shape uh, has uh, is due to the hyperbolic pressure gradient in this particular case. There is another example of a fractured rock. Of course, there you have preferential flow. And what does it mean with regard to the, uh, to, to the contact of the lixivant uh, to the minerals? Uh, this is quite obvious. Here you have to rely on diffusion-controlled kinetics. Next point is the interplay of the ISR hydrology and the uh, uh, geochemistry. It's the two major sites of in situ recovery. Uh, hydrological conditions are mainly defined by the pore volume exchange rate. This is uh, nothing but the uh, ratio of the volumetric flow rate over the effective uh, porosity uh, pore volume. Then the chemistry uh, with the two sides, kinetics and the thermodynamic conditions. And with regard to kinetics, it's important to have an understanding of the leaching rate. Uh, the reactive surface, and that is what I'd like to point out, and what we have seen in the tomographic studies, is an important parameter for defining the leaching rate and to uh, finally to making an in situ recovery economic. So more dynamic conditions uh, for the various species facing and also the exchange sites like on clays um, result in acid-base reaction, redox reaction and surface effects. And this, uh, in this way we have in some time thermodynamic conditions or constraints um, impacting the leaching rates and that's what you have to understand to uh, avoid those. Uh, in general, an increasing leaching parameter uh, leads to a much faster recovery of your metal. And uh, what we are doing is to uh, uh, increase the uh, uh, leach parameter as much as possible to minimize the lifetime of a well field and to make the in situ recovery most economic. Here is a uh, summary of or a relationship based on uh, data uh, the uh, uh, correlation of the uh, free fluid porosity and the permeability. These are the overall trends. 
uh, the guideline is based on a Cresani Kármán equation, and here you see the trends on the one side. Increasing grain size results in a better permeability, and uh, an increased clay content uh, results in a, a less and lower permeability. What we consider as the window for applying the uh, in-situ in recovery is highlighted here by this green area. You need porosity, you need permeability to establish a reasonable well field operation. Um, you see also that at increased cementation by carbonates or silicates, the permeability decreases. Again, this is our industrial practice. It might be a differ in some specific cases, but in most uh, uh, operations, we have conditions around this area here, around 1 Darcy, and porosity at least 25%. The consequences with regard to uh, well field hydrology are summarized here. The permeability uh, results in an extraction flow rate that can be simply estimated. Again, the free fluid porosity uh, defines the effective pore volume. This is the reaction space we have to rely on in the underground. The pore volume exchange rate, uh, Q, is uh, defined by this ratio uh, volumetric flow over the uh, pore volume. Uh, this is the inverse of the hydraulic retention time. Q is an important kinetic parameter to get the reactants in on the one side and to get the leached metals out. The uh, uh, practical range of this Q parameter uh, is uh, between 0.05 to 0.2 per day. We are running the operations uh, more in this hi uh, highlighted uh, area shown here resulting in a hydraulic retention time uh, of five to 20 days. But in most applications we have, it's closer to five days. Then uh, fracturing is considered to be a measure to uh, in, uh, stimulate the permeability. I don't like to go into the details of hydraulic fracturing, acidizing, uh, thermal fracturing, and other techniques including explosive stimulation, acoustic stimulation, electric stimulation. Just for the sake of completeness, I refer to uh, trilling and blasting that have been applied in the past for block, block leaching operations in East Germany. Uh, as a matter of fact, for physical reasons, uh, the main constraint of uh, fracturing and permeability stimulation is just the simple uh, constraint uh, by the incompressibility of rock. Uh, several ALTA uh, uh, contributions will be held later today, and I'm be most interested to seeing the outcome of those. Leach kinetics are typically represented by uh, some empirical formula uh, comprising uh, a kin basic kinetic rate factor. That is the reactive surface I was referring to already, and then we have the product of different kinetic factors de describing the dependence uh, on the physical uh, chemical conditions. Typically, uh, we have uh, to consider quite a few factors or terms in this formula. And here we have um, the acidity, the oxidation potential expects, expressed in terms of electron acceptor concentration, the complexing ion concentration applied in alkaline leaching operations, the temperature dependence, it's the Arrhenius factor, the flow dependence based on dumb curler approach, and last not least, the enzyme kinetics. I have asked uh, many bi uh, biologists or microbiologists to provide uh, some data. We are prepared to simulate this, but we haven't yet get uh, appropriate parameters to do that. Uh, and uh, just to emphasize the importance of understanding the kinetics independence on such critical parameters, I show here um, a little um, uh, figure that is the uh, kinetic rate of uraninite leaching as function of the pH value. The lower the pH, uh, the higher the rate. And on the one side, and this is the electron acceptor concentration, of course, the more oxidant potential you inject, the higher the leaching rate. Uh, the same has been studied for all the competing interfering uh, reactions, including pyrite dissolution and also the degradation of organic matter in the underground. And uh, this was the key for solving what we call the redox puzzle. 
uh, then the kinetic rates and uh, reserve depletion can be uh, estimated. I, I always uh, urge uh, our guys to have a basic understanding of such fundamental uh, uh, data. What you have to understand is that you can express the kinetic rate in uh, different terms, uh, in relative terms for the genetic, generic uh, estimates. It's just to uh, refer the uh, 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 rate in moles per day divided by the reserves in moles, and you get just the relative depletion uh, of the reserve in a well field uh, space um, in time. So um, what we observe mainly is an uh, exponential depletion of the reserve in the underground. So uh, uh, the uh, rate, the overall rate that we uh, realize in the industrial practice uh, is shown here. Uh, that means the rate is in the order of 0.01 to, uh, to down to 0.005 and further to 0.001 per day. That's about the applicability range uh, corresponding to a depletion half-life of 2.3 to 4.6 months and uh, two, uh, 23 months in, in the last case. So uh, what we prefer is to stay in this green area. Again, you see here the uh, rate parameter uh, effect on the uh, lifetime of the well field operation. The rate R can be significantly impacted by the available reaction space. Uh, ideal for porous conditions, critical for fractured conditions, and uh, second uh, by thermodynamic constraints, uh, including the availability of the oxidation potential. Uh, here you see the effect of the rate parameter again that can be impacted by increasing uh, pyrite concentrations and in order, in, in order to overcome the impact of pyrite, uh, for instance, uh, you have to increase the uh, injected oxidation potential and then you get back to favorable production conditions. Uh, with regard to bioleaching, uh, I uh, just refer to uh, cases where the bioleaching works. That is in the case of tank leaching and heap leaching, where you have uh, cheap access to the oxidant. Uh, so that means uh, here, based on ground or crushed ore, this uh, can be realized in the industry. But the question is, will in C2 bioleaching work? where the uh, uh, supply of oxidant is a constraining parameter. So uh, that is, uh, again, the, the point. Can we uh, inject sufficient oxidation ox uh, oxygen in the underground? And what we have learned in our industrial applications, uh, it, would, it would not help us. It might work in specific cases, but uh, for us, bioleaching is just a side effect and sometimes interfering uh, bioleaching uh, effects occur. Uh, this is uh, shown here in some more detail, and I'd like to emphasize the electron exchanged per metal atom uh, for uraninite is quite favorable, but in the case of other sulfitic metals, you have to exchange uh, a significant number of elements. You consume a lot of oxidation potential, and this results in a particular estimate. If you inject uh, ATP PM02 under pressurized conditions, this uh, corresponds to a maximum metal concentrations that can be leached theoretically, that's a stringent uh, um, uh, constraint. Uh, for, met for uranium, it's quite favorable, for, but for the other sulfitic ores, it's a uh, constraint that uh, will uh, impact the applicability of uh, uh, bioleaching as well. So uh, with regard to economic figures, I uh, show here uh, just an example, uh, these are uh, simulated OPEX and CAPEX for a chalcosite and copper deposit under certain conditions. And you see that the uh, uh, OPEX are dominated by the oxidant consumption, the CAPEX are dominated by the well construction costs. And just to uh, visualize uh, what happens if we go to uh, oxidized ore conditions, uh, in the case of copper recovery, then you reduce the OPEX significantly. 
and on the other side, the depth reduced to 50 meters results in much less capex. You can extrapolate this in the other way. So the unit cost independence on parameters has been systematized as function of uh, calcite grade. That is something to overcome in the early stage based on preconditioning. Uh, the ore grades, the depth of the ore body, and uh, permeability, porosity, uh, and last but not least, the spacing of the well field. Uh, so what we can see here, uh, the green uh, areas show the favorable conditions, the light green. The light green is just uh, maybe uh, feasible. So uh, the target innovations uh, of ISR technology are summarized here. Uh, this is uh, the last slide I have. Uh, what, is the, what are the objectives of mostly scientific investigations? It's low-grade ore bodies, deep formations, other than sedimentary or porous formations, application to other than uranium deposits, polymetallurgical recovery, in situ bioleaching, non-conventional well design, non-stationary flow regimes, uh, and creation of artificial barriers. Here I have uh, included some comments from our side. I think that the polymetallurgical application is very promising and also uh, the uh, non-stationary flow regimes. Uh, there are critical rem remarks from our industrial pr perspective with regard to uh, other target innovations. So uh, significant progress has been uh, achieved in understanding the ISR game and the major achievements by Heathgate uh, at the Beverly for mile operations consequent in implementation of innovative technology, about doubling the uh, uh, production in the past two years to a sustainable level of plus four million pounds per year. Well field lifetime about eight to 16 months, very short, uh, uh, combined with uh, 30 to 50 poor volume exchanges. And economic production has been realized under current weak market conditions. The, our operations are envi environmentally compliant and the current plant upgrade opens us the uh, uh, way towards 4.0 solutions. Last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge all the excellent contributions by the teams at Heathgate and UIT, and I thank you for your... Uh, thank you very much. And...